Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's HO Colloquium by David Barham. David Barham is an award-winning author, science journalist, and broadcaster. For many years, he worked in public radio, and if you are a long-time NPR listener, you might remember his voice from All Things Considered and Morning Edition as far back as the 1980s and 1990s. He moved from Boston to Boulder in 1998 to become a TED Scripps Fellow in Environmental journal Journalism at CU, which led to his first book, The Beast in the Garden, which tells a true story about mountain lions and people here on the front range. Today, he will talk about his 2017 book, American Eclipse, which received the annual book prize from the American Institute of Physics and is being published next month in advance of the total solar eclipse on April 8th of this year. I should add that David is himself an avid eclipse uh, chaser. He is witness, he has witnessed eight total solar eclipses on five continents, and I'll let him take it from there. He will talk about edition and the eclipse that enlightened America. Thanks, Masumi. Thank you all for coming. It's nice to meet you. Normally, when I speak about my book, I'm not talking to people who know a lot more about the sun than I do. And, pro and probably many of you have seen uh, even more total solar eclipses than I have. Um, but I'm here today thanks to Sarah Gibson, whom I met at CU back in October. She kindly came and spoke on a panel I had moderated for a meeting of the National Association of Science Writers. So she came and spoke to writers about solar science. So I figured I would return the favor and speak to solar scientists about some of my writing, which has to do with the sun and a total solar eclipse that uh, passed over this part of the country many, many years ago. So I'm, I will be uh, talking about my book and showing a bunch of slides. Um, and uh, I've got uh, a story to tell. Uh, I apologize if parts of the story are a little elementary in terms of the science, because I generally give this talk to a lay audience. Uh, but before I get to the story itself, I just want to talk briefly about how I came to write the book. And now, have all of you seen a total solar eclipse? Has anyone not seen a total solar eclipse? <laughs> okay. All right. uh, well, I saw my first total solar eclipse 26 years ago. It was 1998 in Aruba. And actually, I saw down the hall here, there's a, a photo of the corona that year. But actually, the story of how the book came about starts even before that, back in 1994, when uh, there was an annular eclipse that passed over the United States in May of 94. And I was working for NPR, and I was doing a story for Morning Edition about the eclipse uh, in advance of it. And I happened to interview Jay Pasikoff, um, any of you probably mm -hmm. knew. Um, Jay at the time, actually he was working at, uh, he was at the uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center briefly away from uh, Williams College. But I interviewed him in advance of the annular eclipse just to find out what it was all about, how to observe it, uh, that sort of thing. And at the end of the interview, Jay just turned to me uh, and he said, you know, as interesting as this annular eclipse is going to be, um, much more interesting and awe-inspiring is a total so. And he took the opportunity to explain to me what happens in a total solar eclipse. And then he said, and I'll never forget it, he said, you know, before you die, you owe it to yourself to experience a total solar eclipse. And he said it, uh, I'm tearing up because I, he died uh, a year and a half ago. Um, he said it with such passion and he, he really got my attention. And he, he described the total eclipse so vividly that I, I thought, well, I'm going to take this guy seriously. And I, so I did some research and I discovered that a few years later in 98, there was going to be a total solar eclipse crossing the Caribbean. And why not go to Aruba in February anyway? So I did that and uh, showed up at the Hyatt Regency. And was, was anyone else in Aruba in 98? Uh, but I was just out on the, the beach waiting for the show to begin and watching the as the partial phases of it, the eclipse went by through my eclipse classes. And at the moment of totality, when the when the beach just erupted in cheers, I took off my eclipse glasses 
It was the most spectacular thing I've ever seen in my life. And I am not in any sense a traditionally religious person. But I tell you, it was a spiritual experience. I just felt connected to the universe in a way that I never had before. And that year, part of it was not only was the corona just spectacular, but I could see three planets very clearly flanking the sun. And I had this visceral sense that I had left the earth and I was standing outside the solar system looking back at the center of it. Like, like I was looking at a diagram from a high school science text about how the universe works, how the solar system works. That here are the planets and they go around the sun. And when it was over, of course, I was hooked and I became a quick Um But on that beach in Aruba in 1998, as a science writer, I thought, I want to write about this. I want to somehow bring to life the excitement of a total solar eclipse. But as soon as I started looking into it, I realized that if I was going to write a book about a total solar eclipse or about eclipses in general, the time to do it would be in 2017 to wait 19 years for my book to come out because that's when, uh, to, to 2017, uh, that's when people in America would be interested in total eclipses. So I put the, the project on hold. And then around 2012, 2013, I thought, well, if I'm going to have a book come out in 2017, I better figure out what it's going to be. And um, I didn't, I, you know, I'm a, I write for a general audience. I didn't want to write a science heavy book. I want it to be scientifically accurate, but it, I wanted to tell a good story. Uh, something that would get the general public's attention about eclipses. So I started looking around, and uh, eventually what I stumbled on was a story from this very part of the world that we're in right now, which is the American West. So the West is, of course, a landscape filled with history and legend. The gunfight at the OK Corral, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Buffalo uh, Bill, Calamity Jane, it's sometimes hard to distinguish where facts end and fiction begins. Well, I came across a particularly puzzling tale from the Old West. Now, we're here in Colorado, but if you drive north to Wyoming and then west across the Laramie Plains, head over the uh, snowy range of the Medicine Bow Mountains, you'll eventually come to the Sierra Madres. And this is where you'll find Battle Lake, set against the slope of granite and spruce uh, on the shoulder of State Highway 7. And you'll see a historical marker here on the side of the highway. And here's what it says. Thomas A. Edison camped near this spot in 1878 while on a fishing trip. It was here that his attention was directed to the fiber from his bamboo fishing pole, which he tested as a suitable filament for his incandescent electric lamp. Well, the claim put more plainly elsewhere is that it was here that Edison, in a flash of inspiration, devised his light bulb. Well, this was intriguing, and I wanted to know, is that true? Well, what better place to look than True West magazine? And indeed, back in the 1960s, they ran an article on, uh, on this uh, very story. It is a fact that Edison came to Wyoming in 1878, just before he invented the light bulb. He did go fishing at Battle Lake. And what brought him to Wyoming? Well, he was in the West, with a bunch of astronomers, and they had come to observe a total solar eclipse. Uh, and that is Edison, uh, second from the right over there. And so I decided to look into this, to delve into the archives, to go back in time, to learn why Edison came for the eclipse, who were his companions, why was the eclipse so important, and what lasting impact did it have? Now, let me say right off the bat that the light bulb story is legend. Edison did not invent the incandescent lamp in Wyoming, but the true story is no less compelling. As I discovered, and as I write in my book, Edison and others who went west in 1878 did change America in some profound ways, and the eclipse was the catalyst. So let me tell you the true story of the scientist who raced to the American frontier for the total solar eclipse of 1878. But first, some context. In 1878, the general outlines of modern America were already in place. Our national borders looked like they do today. The Civil War was over. The nation then had 38 states, and the most recent addition was Colorado. 
We were a vibrant can-do nation, population 50 million and growing fast. We were building big cities and spreading west. The mindset, the rallying cry was manifest destiny. The Transcontinental Railroad had recently been completed, opening new territory to settlement and sparking clashes between the pioneers and Native Americans. We were a rapidly developing adolescent nation. We had just celebrated our 100th uh, birthday, and we were, you might say, intellectually immature. Europe was the center of Western culture, the place where respectable literature and music and art was produced, and Europe led the world in science. In fact, Europe led the world in chasing eclipses. Now, do you know, all know the basics, but let me just say, because I always do, a solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, which means the moon casts its shadow on the Earth. Now, there are actually two separate parts of the moon's shadow. So if I zoom in to show just the moon and the Earth, there we go. Uh, oops. The outer zone of the shadow with the dashed lines is the penumbra. That's an area of partial shadow, and anyone in that region will see a partial solar eclipse. But it's only in the dark central part, the inner cone, the umbra, where the moon completely blocks uh, the sun, producing a total eclipse. Now, of course, everything's in motion. The moon is orbiting the Earth. The Earth is revolving. So this dot doesn't sit still, but zooms across the Earth and uh, traces a curving path, which is the path of totality. Of course, anyone in that zone will briefly see the sun disappear. Now, total solar eclipses occur about once every 18 months somewhere on the planet. So over time, if you map them, they trace out paths that look sort of like spaghetti thrown at a globe like that. And these are the tracks of total solar eclipses from 1842 to 1893. Uh, and this era, the second half of the 19th century, was a particularly important time. In fact, it's been called the golden age of eclipse expeditions because eclipses were not merely natural spectacles to marvel at, but at this time they were keenly important for science. Astronomers were just starting to unravel the mysteries of the sun. What is this great ball of fire at the center of our solar system? What is it made of? What fuels it? Uh, and there were certain studies of the sun that could only be done during those brief few minutes of a total solar eclipse. During a total eclipse, the super bright surface of the sun is blocked. It allows scientists to look at what surrounds the sun, prominences, of course, and the corona. Uh, so this time, uh, whenever a total eclipse was predicted during this era, such as this eclipse in India in 1871, astronomers took their telescopes and spectroscopes and other equipment and headed off to sit in the path of totality. They hoped that clouds didn't show up, and they'd frantically conduct their observations in those two or three minutes of midday darkness. And this is a, a British team in India in 1871. Now, the United States did launch some eclipse expeditions too, but the Europeans were the leaders. Until, that is, 1878, when the moon's shadow was set to visit our own backyard. The date was July 29, 1878, and the path of totality ran right down the American frontier, Montana territory to Texas. So here was America's chance to shine or an opportunity to slip up and embarrass ourselves. But if all went well, we would show the rest of the world what we were capable of as a scientific nation. And so the eclipse was a big national undertaking. The US government issued official instructions for observing the eclipse, how to view it safely, and how to collect information that could be helpful to astronomers. Now, the solar corona, which today we know is the sun's outer atmosphere, back then it was a great mystery. Just characterizing its shape and size was important. So in an early form of crowdsourcing, federal scientists asked people who were artistically inclined to sketch the corona and submit their drawings to Washington. The instructions included a template you could use, and an example of what a proper drawing might look like, indicating the contours of the inner and outer corona. Meanwhile, the government encouraged professional astronomers to go west for the eclipse. It offered logistical advice on railroad travel for those going privately, and the U.S. Naval Observatory put out the call for scientist volunteers 
to participate in a half dozen government eclipse expeditions that were being assembled. And the responses came back like RSVPs to a wedding invitation. Here you can see the Cincinnati Observatory accepts the invitation. The Morrison Observatory accepts. Yale College accepts. Harvard sent its regrets. <laughs> so the government assembled its scientific parties and dispatched them to the frontier to meet the moon's shadow. Uh, this is one Naval Observatory team in Colorado that set up its telescopes on the roof of the Teller House Hotel in Central City, uh, outside, uh, not very far from here. And you can actually see this is, uh, I, think, I believe that's Edward Holden, who went on to become the director of the Lick Observatory and then was kicked out because everyone hated him. But they they used uh, the the uh, chimneys and piers for some of the telescopes. Uh, Denver was also in the path of totality. Uh, that's where a team from Princeton camped out for a month, preparing for the eclipse. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this is Charles A. Gilman, who was a uh, famous astronomer. Uh, there were also parties in Wyoming. This camp was set up uh, by the U.S. Naval Observatory right next to the Transcontinental Railroad. You can see some telescopes in a temporary shack that had a removable cam canvas roof over there on the right. And also in Wyoming, of course, was this group. So let me talk about this extraordinary collection of scientific talent that gathered in the rough and tumble railroad town of Rollins, Wyoming. And I'll mention just a few of these esteemed individuals. If we zoom in on the right, uh, so second from the right is Thomas Edison, and I'll get back to him in a moment. Uh, next to him on the far right, uh, that is Norman Lockyer. Uh, Lockyer was a British astronomer, the man who famously identified the element helium in the sun at a time when it had yet to be discovered on Earth. He was also the founding editor of the British journal Nature. On the far left, uh, this large fellow standing beside his wife, Annette, is James Craig Watson. Now, Watson was a professor of astronomy at the University of Michigan. Uh, this was his domain, the paradoxically named Detroit Observatory in Ann Arbor. Uh, and Watson was known as a planet hunter. Now, if you were to look at a solar system chart from that era, like this one from 1846, you'll notice that the planets look somewhat different from the way they do today. So first, if I zoom in a bit on the region between Mars and Jupiter, you'll see some additional planets. Uh, there's Vesta, Juno, Ceres, Pallas. Well, that is, of course, the asteroid belt. And back then, asteroids were considered planets. They were minor planets, but they received names just like the major ones, and finding them was a big deal. Well, James Craig Watson had a knack for discovering asteroids. He was one of the top planet hunters in the world. I now zoom in closer to the sun and you'll see something even more perplexing. And that is between Mercury and the sun, there's another planet, Vulcan. Now at the time, Vulcan was a hypothetical planet. Many astronomers believed that it had to exist because, because Mercury's orbit didn't make sense otherwise. Mercury acted as if there was some mass between it and the sun that was tugging it along. Now, no one had reliably seen Vulcan, but that wasn't really a surprise. It's so close to the sun, it would never be in the sky at night, and you couldn't see it in the daytime because it would be lost in the sun's glare. About the only time you might catch a glimpse of Vulcan would be during uh, the brief daytime darkness of a total solar eclipse when the moon briefly blocks the bright surface of the sun, enabling you to see what sits nearby. So Watson, on the left, came to Wyoming in 1878, determined to find Vulcan. Now, as for Thomas Edison, he was just 31 years old at the time, but he was already a global celebrity due to a recent invention, and that was the phonograph. This simple contraption with a hand crank and tin foil to record sound was an absolute sensation. Before Edison, 
No one even imagined that it was possible ever to capture and release sound. Edison was hailed as a genius. Uh, he was, people, people called him a wizard. In fact, he was the wizard of Menlo Park because at the time he had his famous laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Well, this was a ridiculously productive and creative period for Edison. He was dreaming up strange and wondrous inventions constantly. Uh, there was this thing called the aerophone, which was an enormous loudspeaker that he suggested could be used in lighthouses to shout warnings at ships. There was the phonomotor, which used the, the power of the human voice to turn a wheel. And there was this thing, the tesimeter. Now, the tesimeter was an extremely sensitive heat detector, basically an electric thermometer that Edison claimed could measure changes in temperature as small as one millionth of a degree Fahrenheit. Today, we would call the tesimeter an infrared detector. Now, an astronomer had encouraged Edison to invent the device, and several astronomers were keen to get their hands on tesimeters for the eclipse to point it at the solar corona to see if that mysterious halo gave off not just light, but heat as well. In the end, Edison decided he would go to Wyoming and do the experiment himself to show that he was not just an inventor, but a serious scientist. But these were not the most serious of surroundings. It was the Wild West after all. And Edison ended up attaching his tesimeter to a telescope and setting up his equipment in a little shed you'll see in the back there. And I'll zoom in on it. It looks sort of like a, a, an outhouse. It was actually a hen house that he retrofitted into a makeshift observatory. And that's Edison's uh, telescope poking out of the Now, there were dozens of notable scientists who came west to observe the eclipse. And in my book, I write about many of them. But the main characters I focus on are Edison, Watson, the planet hunter, and a third scientist who traveled to the frontier with very different intent. And her name was Mariah Mitchell. Now, Mariah Mitchell was by far the best known female scientist in America in the 19th century. She first came to prominence in 1847 when she discovered a comet and earned a gold medal from the King of Denmark. By 1878, she was teaching astronomy at Vassar, the pioneering all women's college. No surprise, Mitchell was a staunch advocate for, for women's higher education. And this was a time when women's colleges were coming under attack. You see, in 1873, a sensational best-selling book came out that claimed college education could ruin a girl's health. It was written by a Boston doctor, a Harvard doctor, Edward H. Clark, who argued that by taxing the brain, Education sapped energy from other parts of a girl's maturing body, including her reproductive organs, and therefore higher learning could turn female college students into sterile, masculine invalids. I'm not kidding. He wrote that education could result in, quote, a dropping out of maternal instincts and an appearance of Amazonian coarseness and fits. And it gets better. Such persons, he wrote, are analogous to the sexless class of termites. Well, Mariah Mitchell believed that this was ridiculous. She encouraged young women to use their brains in her astronomy course at Vassar. But that wasn't enough. She needed to convince American society that Dr. Clark's book was rubbish. So in 1878, she did something remarkable. As groups of men were assembling eclipse expeditions to Wyoming and Colorado, she assembled an all-female expedition. And here it is. This is the Vassar College Eclipse Party in Denver. Uh, they were here to make scientific observations, but it was more than just a scientific endeavor. It was, in essence, political theater to demonstrate to a skeptical public that women could be smart, educated, healthy, and feminine to boot. So these three main characters of mine had a lot on the line. Edison was out to prove the value of his tesimeter and to prove himself a scientist. Watson was out to find uh, Vulcan and the glory that would come from discovering the planet. And Mitchell was out to change minds about the role of women in science and higher education. So in this and other ways, the eclipse was a kind of competition. And the public followed closely the various players and what they were out to achieve. So this country that was not 
known for embracing science, suddenly cared about astronomy. Newspapers met the demand for information by providing extensive coverage. Here's the Chicago Tribune from a week before the eclipse. It offered a, a map showing the path of totality. In the lower right, there's a star map showing what a, a chart of the heavens, showing what stars you might see during totality if you were in the path. Uh, and the paper described what the scientists were up to. And although Chicago was only going to see a partial eclipse, people were keen to get a front row seat. So there were advertisements for eclipse tours into the path of totality, just like today. And so the, the public headed west, and the destination for most eclipse tourists was Denver. The city was, as you can imagine, overrun with visitors. The hotels ran out of, ran out of room, so guests were left to sleep on pots in the hotel parlors, or uh, one gentleman even reportedly slept on a, on a billiard table. Uh, the public procured eclipse glasses. Now, there were no mass produced glasses with mylar lenses back then, but newsboys took shards of glass and smoked them over flames, and they collected pieces of colored glass. This guy is holding a pane of blue glass, you can see. Not really safe by today's standards, but that's what they did back then. Uh, and the, the newsboys would sell these pieces of colored and smoked glass on, on street corners. Here's your colored glass for seeing the eclipse, they cried. And mind you, this is verbatim from an 1878 article. Genuine French imported mazarine blue, London smoke and bottle green, three kinds, three cents each or two for five. Well, I have to say immersing myself in this history was great fun. Reading old newspapers and scientific reports really cast me back in time. And I enjoyed tracking down what remains from that era as I retraced my, my character's footsteps. So I, I went to Vassar to visit the observatory that Mariah Mitchell oversaw during her time there and that she still presides over, although now as a bronze bust. I visited Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory, which was reconstructed by Henry Ford in Michigan. And that's where I found a tesimeter. Also in Michigan, you can find James Craig Watson's Detroit Observatory in Ann Arbor. And nearby in Ypsilanti, I tracked down the telescope that Watson brought to Wyoming to look for Vulcan. So that telescope is the one that's front and center here in that 1878 photograph. I also visited the spot in Rollins, Wyoming, where that photo was taken. That was a bit of a disappointment. It's now the parking lot at the post office. <laughs> But most of my research was done in Washington at the uh, Library of Congress and at the National Archives because it's there that a lot of the original documents have been stored. Tumbling envelopes and files filled with letters and telegrams and scientific reports. And remember, I told you that the government was interested in artwork of the eclipse as well. So the general, uh, the general public and scientists submitted their drawings and paintings of the corona from simple uh, pencil sketches like this one, which was drawn by uh, Wyoming's territorial governor. Other depictions were more elaborate. I just adore this watercolor. Uh, and this pastel. And this piece of artwork that was uh, produced by a British amateur astronomer who went to Denver for the eclipse. And then there's this, which was a view uh, from 14,000 feet up on top of Pikes Peak, where a particularly hardy group of scientists battled snowstorms in July and altitude sickness, uh, but just got an amazing view of the coronal streamers from that high up. Anyway, as you can tell, on Eclipse Day itself, many people enjoyed an amazing view of the spectacle. And it was a proud and exciting day for my three main characters. Now, I don't want to spoil the story by giving everything away. But Edison in the test of his dosimeter, um, Mariah Mitchell in her quest to change public attitudes, even Watson in his quest for Vulcan, all of my char characters were quite pleased with how things turned out on that day. And the headlines after the eclipse were effusive. Great results announced the Chicago paper. Most important observations ever made to the New York Herald. It was a banner day for these three scientists, and it was for America, too. The eclipse that crossed the frontier enabled this young country to prove to the world 
that it could do science. It could take on Europe. As one local boasted to a visitor from England, sir, Colorado can beat the world in eclipses as in everything else. The Rocky Mountain eclipse helped boost America's interest in science and bolstered its confidence in that realm. Uh, this, by the way, that view from Harper's Weekly, that's Gray's and Tories in the background. Um, this was Argentine Pass, I think it's called, mm -hmm. where the, uh, those people were standing, uh, that view of the, of the eclipse. Anyway, admittedly, the specific achievements of my characters did not quite pan out the way they might have liked. Mariah Mitchell did help open the doors of science and higher education to women, but it's not like male scientists suddenly embraced their female counterparts in 1878. It was the beginning of a large, long, hard, continuing struggle. Did Watson really discover the planet Vulcan? You can probably guess. <clears throat> As for Edison's tesimeter, well, it never did live up to its hype. And Edison quickly turned to other projects. In fact, the day after he returned from Wyoming, he started work on a new invention. Now, there are some connections between the eclipse and the light bulb. The scientist Edison spent time with in Wyoming encouraged him to focus on electric light and power, and the time away from the laboratory left him refreshed and ready to take on new challenges. But did Edison dream up the light bulb on the shores of that lake? No. The eclipse of 1878 did not illuminate America in the way the historical marker claims. However, it did enlighten America, helping to push this upstart nation toward its, what it soon would become, the undeniable global superpower in science, a country that would, in this intellectual realm, eclipse the world. And as I mentioned at the start, or Masumi did, uh, my book is actually being republished in a new paperback edition two weeks from now. Uh, and while, while the new book tells the same story as the old book, uh, the new one has an afterword I've written uh, reflecting on the 2017 eclipse in the U.S. and the legacy of Jay Pasikoff and all he did to, to get the public excited about that eclipse. Um, and in, in case you're interested, I should say, or if you have friends or colleagues who are interested, I will be speaking at the Boulder Bookstore, uh, doing a little reading from the book and signing books on Wednesday, February 28th in the evening. And I would encourage folks to come if you're interested. And is anyone going to be in Texas for the eclipse on April 8th? Uh, okay. Well, if any of you will be anywhere near Waco on April 7th, Sunday, if you can believe it, uh, my little old book has been turned into a musical. <laughs> Not something I ever thought would happen, uh, but actually, it's actually quite remarkable. Um, the composer lyricist is Michael John Lacusa, who's got several Tony nominations. He just had a new show that opened Lincoln Center in New York last fall. He's really good. Um, the show has yet to be produced in full. I saw a workshop production in New York a year and a half ago. In Waco on April 7th, there will be two concert performances of some of the songs from the show. That'll be the first time the public ever gets to hear uh, what he's got. Um, and that'll be at Baylor. Uh, there's an 11.30 a.m. and a 7.30 p.m. Um, uh, performance. But anyway, now if, if you're at all interested on my website, which is American-Eclipse.com, I've got information about the Boulder Bookstore event and the uh, musical event in Waco. Tickets are supposed to go on sale any day now, and I'll provide a link when that happens. But anyway, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to talk about the 1878 eclipse. I also brought, I don't want to pass this around, but afterwards, you're welcome to come up and look at this. This is an original volume of the U.S. Naval, Observ Naval Observatory reports on the eclipse of 1878. Um, so you can see there was a lot of material to work with when I was writing my book. But again, I'm happy to answer questions. So, uh, yeah, Graham. Graham. Uh, okay, you go ahead. Yeah, uh, question. Do you want to go into the uh, chicken coop problem? Why it is that uh, Edison never got any data? Well, that, I'm afraid to say, is a legend. Uh, 
the, the story that's come down through the ages is that as totality uh, approached, the chickens came home to roost and came into the hen house and there was feathers everywhere and he wasn't able to get you know, to make any observations. Unfortunately, there is no evidence from the time that that was true. Ed has never talked about that. Um, it is true that he didn't really get good results, but that's because he didn't, uh, he, he set his tesimeters, it was too sensitive. Uh, he didn't know how much heat he would detect. And as soon as uh, totality set in and he, and he put the, uh, his telescope on the corona, immediately uh, the, the recording went off the scale. So he found plenty of heat in the corona, but he didn't know how much because he couldn't actually measure it. It, it peaked out. Um, yeah, but the, but the story that's often told is that the chickens came home to roost. But I'm sorry to say that, like him inventing the light bulb uh, at Battle Lake is a legend. Is the decimeter actually, well, it wasn't actually sensitive enough to measure a millionth of a degree well, it, it it turns out there, well, uh, there was actually, I think it was, well, Jack Eddy, who was here years ago and wrote, he he loved the eclipse of 1870. He wrote a piece for uh, Sky and Telescope back in the 1970s, which was also influential in my deciding to write a whole book about it. And he wrote a um, a scientific paper trying to analyze just how, whether the exhibitor worked. And what it found i'm forgetting the specifics of it. it 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 clearly was a highly sensitive device but it did not provide uh results that could be replicated it was just it was highly erratic it would just swing all over the place and so it was given up uh very soon after as anything that was of any use but it probably did reliably detect heat if we just don't know how much did, did Watson uh, claim that he saw Vulcan during the eclipse? Oh, yes. Not, <laughs> so, what happened? What is the story so, there? so Watson thought he found two Vulcans, <laughs> in fact, and it, which which fit with the theory. I mean, the, the thought was there was at least one planet. There could be multiple ones between Mercury and the sun. Uh, and he saw two objects that he was convinced were planets that were not on his star chart. Um, but... Yeah, and he he died a few years later, still claiming that he had found two Vulcans. Uh, but it's pretty clear he mistook two two stars for them. But that in the days after the eclipse, that was the big news that Watson had found Vulcan. Uh, but it was a huge embarrassment. And as you all probably know, not only is there no Vulcan, but there couldn't be a Vulcan because the reason they they thought that there was a Vulcan is because Newtonian mechanics broke down when you're getting that close to the sun. And it was Einstein who solved the mystery of why Mercury's orbit is the way it is in general relativity. Okay. All right, so nine years before, 1869, there had been another eclipse that went across the US. Yes. Uh, further, further east across the Arguably, scientifically, that was probably a more important eclipse. That's where Young discovered the green line, right? right. Young was already famous worldwide for having discovered the, the green line. What was the difference? Had things evolved a lot in terms of, I mean, we've gone through the centennial, the U.S. desire for the U.S. to show it was on par with these European nations and so on. But, so the 1869 eclipse, definitely there was a lot of attention paid to that, but not nearly as much as the 1878 eclipse. Um, I think part of that was Edison himself. Just Edison coming west of the eclipse drew a lot of attention here. Um, and, you know, American science had matured 10 years since the 1869 one. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, but both were important. But the, the, there are some wonderful, and Mariah Mitchell was actually in, in Iowa too. She brought a bunch of best students there. But there too, going to Iowa was not considered quite as exciting as going to what was still the Wild West. And so she got a lot more attention in 1878 than she did in 1869 as well. 
Did it generate any excitement in Europe? Yeah. Oh, the, well, the other thing I might say is the. Um, oh yeah, no, it definitely was attention. There were Europeans who came over in 1878, and they were reporting on it back there. Um, but the the 1869 eclipse, even by 1878, if I have this right, the U.S. Naval Observatory still had not published their reports from the 1869 eclipse, which it was a real source of embarrassment. Um, and that the U.S. just couldn't get its act together. Uh, and so again, 1878 was a chance to show that now we had our act together. And this came out pretty soon after the 1878 eclipse. But there, yeah, there were lots of folks who came home from Europe. I mean, Norman Lockyer, of course, uh, but others as well. So are you going to observe it in Waco or where are you observing? Well, yeah, I will be in Waco. I had uh, actually decided to go there before I knew that this musical thing was going to happen. There. <laughs> uh, but I've got my whole family coming down and joining me there. Um, I just was, I mean, Texas, clearly the best place to be in the U.S. in terms of odds of clear skies. Uh -huh. sure. um, I was looking for a place where there are 16 of us where I figured if we if we uh, got on it early enough, we could probably find a place for us all to stay that wasn't going to cost an absolute fortune. Logistically, it's relatively easy to get into and out of. So, yeah. But and there's going to be isn't there going to be a big astronomical meeting in Dallas at that time? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Thanks. Then you got to observe it in Dallas. It's cooler to see it out in the countryside. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't yet know if I'll be in, of course, Waco's not a huge city, but I don't know if I'll be in town or getting outside of it. But I I mean, so again, you, you've seen a lot more yeah, than I've I have. Seen 13. But, uh, the one that I saw in a major city, I, I was in Munich in 99. And I actually enjoyed seeing it in a major city. I was on a rooftop and it was, Great fun to, to see the crowds in the streets below and on other roofs around me, and just this enormous cheer that came up from the entire city as the moon's shadow came in. So I think Dallas could be a fun place. To yeah. Uh, you know what the estimate of the number of Americans who saw the 2017 eclipse? Uh, I'm forgetting what it was. I remember a number like 30 million, but uh... but the there was a study done that looked at um how many people well, saw either the total eclipse the partial eclipse or either online or on tv and it was i mean like 250 million americans observed the eclipse in some fashion and you know it was I mean, bigger than any super bowl uh, just a real rare event that we all shared instead of being in our own political silos and so forth and and the one in uh, in April is going to be an even bigger deal, certainly in terms of the number of people who are in the path of totality. So uh, in April, on April 8th, I think 32 million people live in the path. And I've seen that half the U.S. population lives within a day's drive of the path. How many people will make that drive? I don't know. But this will almost certainly be the most witnessed total solar eclipse in U.S. history. Uh, Was it, I thought, was it cloudy in Denver for the 1878? No, it was beautiful. It was, uh, so it was just perfect skies across Wyoming and Colorado. Texas had some, in some areas, some thin cirrus clouds, so observations were not great, but people could still see the Quran. And um, although my book is, all the scientists I write about came to Wyoming and Colorado, I actually opened the book in Texas. Um, where there were quite a number of people who didn't know the eclipse was coming and literally thought it was the end of the world and thought it was Judgment Day and fell to their knees in prayer and ran to church. Um, even in 1878, when there were widespread predictions that it was coming, but a number of people didn't know. I might mention that uh, I'm giving a uh, talk at the um, on Tuesday, the uh, 13th of February, 
a group called the Retired uh, Professors Association at the University of Colorado. It's a public lecture uh, in occur in uh, Chile, and uh, I'll be talking about you know eclipses, the physics of eclipses, what's really happening, what to do, what not to do. Uh, in particular, on the day of the eclipse, don't drive to the eclipse. You <laughs> won't get there. <laughs> People who went to the uh, 2017 eclipse and trying to get up to or from Wyoming, Nebraska, know all about that. Um, if, but there's a lot of practicalities of uh, uh, what to look for. Uh, things like shadow bands. Has anybody ever seen shadow bands during eclipse? Right. Is that the, when you see the um, like, little images? Yes, like yes, the yes. Just before, just before totality, or just after. Yeah. So I'll talk about those kind of phenomena and why they occur. If you want more information, see me uh, afterwards. So that's the 13th? Uh, Tuesday, the 13th, they'll be in a classroom in uh, the Jilla building at the university. Tim has a question. Oh, sure. Um, hello, hello, David. Uh, my name is Philip Georgia. I'm a scientist here. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was wondering one particular thing that you didn't talk about were the photographs taken during this eclipse by Harkness in Creston and, and Hall in La Junta, Colorado. So I was just wondering, it's, it's interesting for me to go back and look at drawings in time and then compare them. These are some of the first relatively high quality photographs ever taken of an eclipse. So I was wondering what one could conclude about the quality of drawings and human perception compared with, compared with the real thing, namely on the photographs. Well, you know better than I whether to call them high quality photographs or not. Um, I actually have Hark one of Harkness's in, in my book. Uh, I can't really show it to you all, but it's, I mean, it, as you can imagine, it, you're basically only getting to see one small part of the corona. You couldn't, couldn't get anywhere near the range of variation in brightness. Um, and so it just looks sort of like a halo to me. So I, I couldn't really line them up with what people were drawing because they were drawing these really long streamers uh, and those I didn't see in the photographs. Yeah, but uh, the, the photographers were doing multiple exposures and when you combine them, uh, there's one example on our website from 1901 where you can see the, um, the structure across mo most of the corona as a result of processing by, by um, uh, the chap in Bernou, Druckmuller, and and so there is scientific value in those uh, multi multiple exposures. So, yeah, I, 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 my own feeling is that that early on, it depends on the number of different exposures you have. I think the photographic plates were good enough quality then. Um, of course, they were sensitive only to the blue, but that doesn't really matter. But uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting question, and, and it, for me, it's like uh, even with the rec records going back much further in time, e even to back of cave drawings in France and stuff like this, uh, to wonder, you know, what the eclipse, what the corona might have looked like in time, uh, things like the Monde Minimum, this kind of thing. It's it's all uh, it's all kind of fun. I'm not sure how scientific it is, but. Uh, Congratulations on your book, and thank you so much for uh, a wonderful storytelling uh, event for us. I think that's uh, you've really you've really uh, rung some bells with us here, and I really appreciate you coming. Well, thank you, and I'd be interested to see. You said if you've got those on your website, uh, maybe I could. I'll give you my email address. I'll just tell you it. It's D as in David, H as in Henry, Baron, B A R O N, one R at gmail.com. If you could send me a link, I'd love to see what you've got of those photos. But the, the actual original uh, photographic plates uh, I found at the um, National Archives. So if anyone wanted to do some sort of study with them, they still exist. 
Yeah, we have a full, a pretty full archive since photography began, uh, going back to 1859 eclipse, and uh, it, it's we had someone, some people here working with Jack Eddy and independently to scan those in the 70s, and uh, you know we have quite a collection of things. And Don Kalinsky is the guy that maintains this thing at HAO. But anyway, uh, thank you once again. I think it's a, it's just a really fun, really really fun thing to do. Thank you. Anyone else has any other question? Online people? Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker again for Thank you all.